Appalachian Harvest is a food hub located in Southwest Virginia that provides regional herb and vegetable farmers with training, technical support, aggregation, and distribution services, connecting them to retail markets. We currently source produce from farmers in Virginia, Tennessee, West Virginia, Kentucky, and North Carolina. This webinar is made possible by Risk Management Agency 2018 Risk Management Education Partnership Program. Welcome to Entomology for the Organic Grower. I'm Scott Gerald, Agricultural Extension Agent in Scott County, Virginia. Some of the objectives that we're going to look at during this entomology program is some of the basic classifications of the insects. It's hard to be able to control them if you don't know what they are. The existence of insects, how they formed, where they actually came from, their basic forms and structures, the types of metamorphosis that they go through. They then look at some of the injury that we find due to insect feeding, how that impacts us both economically and uh, with the health of the plant. We're also going to look at the benefit and the value of insects within our garden or field and then proper identification and management of the insects that we find. When we look at classification of insects, they follow the standard Linnaeus classification systems. They are grouped by degrees of similarity, whether it be uh, structural parts, things that they feed on, uh, the types of legs, antennae, abdomen, things of that nature. We also need to understand that insects are a part of the animal kingdom. And when we look at the phyla that they're broken down into, we can find arthropods, which include our insects, spiders, mites, crayfish, and the millipedes. Uh, we find the ascomentes, the roundworms, and trichinaceas, the platyhelminthes, your flatworms, flukes, and tapeworms, and the molluscas, which are snails, slugs, and clams. A majority of what we look at when we're dealing with vegetable production are going to be our arthropods and the molluscas. If we look at insects as a whole, insects are one of the most successful animals that we know that are living and surviving. It makes up two out of every three living things. With other arthropods, it makes up over 75% of all of the animal kingdom. And we know that insects have been in the world for at least 350 million years. So when we look at these insects and we know that they have developed over time, we know that they have specific purposes, uh, we know that they have issues that they have adapted to, uh, we're going to look at the ones that actually cause us the most damage. And, and in that case, it's going to be our arthropods. And when we look at the characteristics of these arthropods, they do not have a backbone, so they are invertebrates. They have an exoskeleton or that hard layer around them that provides them with a certain amount of protection. These represent, as I said before, more than three quarters of the animal species that is known to exist. Now we can break arthropodas down into different classes. Uh, the ones that we mostly are going to be looking at today are going to be the insectes class. That's going to be your bugs, beetles, and your lepidopteras, which are, are your butterflies. If we look at different insects that may cause issues to us, pill bugs, sow bugs, uh, these insects are under the crustaceae. They're actually two segmented body parts with these uh, insects, and they're going to have five pairs or ten total legs. Most of the time we do not see any type of damage that occurs with pill bugs and sow bugs in a production field. Where we can see issues with them feeding is when we have high organic matter uh, that may be around that plant, and most of the feeding is going to be secondary in nature. 
arachnidas, those are your spiders, your mites, things of that issue. We're looking at two body segments again with four pairs of legs or eight legs total on these. Again, we normally don't see any issues with the arachnids uh, other than something like potentially a black widow that's living underneath the fruits and vegetables as we would harvest. The symphile is going to be your millipedes and centipedes. Again, they have two body parts with 12 pairs of, of legs. And then here is the one that we see the majority of our problem insects coming from, the insect days. This is three body segmented insects with three pairs or six total legs. Now when we look at these insects, they're going to be divided again into a head, the thorax, which is the middle part of the insect, and the abdomen. We should be able to see on most insects three distinct body parts. If they do have wings, the wings will be attached to that thorax. And on the head, uh, for identification purposes, we're going to be looking more at the antennae and the mouth parts to figure out what type of, of insect it is based off of either damage we see on the plant or the identification under a, a microscope as we look at these insects. Legs also can give us some clues as to what this insect is. So if we have an unknown, those three things, your antennae, your mouth parts, and your legs, are things that we use to try to narrow down what insect might be causing the problems. If we look at the antennae, there are different types of antennae, an aristate, lamellate, serrate, flabellate, um, moniliform, geniculate, plumose, pectinate, cetaceous, stylate, and clavate. Now all of these go into the formation of the antennae and the way that they would look. And each one of these examples uh, gives us an idea of what they would look like. Most of the insects that we deal with uh, that's going to cause economic damage to us in, in a majority of cases are going to have cetaceous type of, of antennae. We also look at the mouth parts of these insects and the ones that's going to cause the most problems for us in most cases are going to be our piercing sucking mouth parts, our siphoning mouth parts, and the chewing mouth parts. These are the ones that's actually going to cause damage to the plants or maybe transmit a disease uh, to that plant while the insect is feeding. Piercing sucking has a long stylus that comes out of the mouth. Um, it is actually one of them that, that would inject um, a thinning agent or a cell wall destructor into the plant itself so that it can extract the juices that come out of that cell wall and we see that damage on the leaf. Um, chewing insects are sort of self-explanatory in that they're going to cause physical damage to the leaf. It removes that, that laminate part of the leaf and it can, the plant itself cannot produce the type of of food that it needs through photosynthesis as it causes those damages. Now we also can see issues with chewing insects as they chew on the stem. Uh, they may girdle the plant or as they chew on the roots it does not allow the plant to bring up enough water and nutrients to sustain proper plant growth or development. When we look at the thorax where a majority of our legs are located uh, we, it can be divided into the pro, the meso, and the metathorax. Uh, and these are where our legs are going to be located. And we can look at the types of legs that we have either by a running leg, a jumping leg, digging, grasping, and for some water insects, even swimming legs. The wings themselves is where we can make the biggest determination in the field with this insect. We have hemipteras, which are half-winged insects, hymenoptera, which means the wings that we do find are membraned, diptera, which has two wings, and isoptera, which means that the wings are equal. Now as we look at the abdomen, 
The abdomen normally is 11 to 12 segments. They can be short, they can be long, they can be curved, depending on the insect and, and how it's developed. A lot of times it might be difficult to, to determine these segments without having either a microscope or a stereoscope to be able to see this insect a little more closely. Now we get a little more into the development of these insects and how they grow. Uh, if we look at it, there's two types of, of growth patterns. There's either a, a simple development or there's a complete development. And when we look at a simple metamorphosis or how they developed, it, the insect will go from an egg to a nymph which is a smaller version of the adult, and then it grows in size until it gets to its adult stage. Now, all of these life stages may look similar. They may have different colors. Uh, or may not have the, the markings that an adult would have, but they're going to be similar enough in appearance that we can uh, we can identify them as being one of the juveniles, and they behave in the same manner as the adult insects would. So a lot of times what we find is a whole family that lives and feeds together on the other side, underside of those plant leaves. We can find a simple or a gradual metamorphosis, again, where we find that egg that hatches, and then that insect grows and develops until it reaches adulthood. Uh, a good example is a box elder bug. We also have squash bugs and other things that follow this same pattern. And you can see the insects are, are readily identifiable as being the same, only immatures and mid-stage growth compared to the adults. When we look at these simple metamorphosis orders, this is where our orthoptera, it's our grasshoppers and crickets, which have chewing mouth parts, two pairs of wings, the first of which is thicker and leathery. We have hemiptera, which are again the half wings. Uh, we have what we call these hemipteras are the true bugs. They have piercing sucking mouth parts, two pairs of wings, the first of which is a half wing. Homopteras are aphids, scales, and mealybugs. They have piercing sucking mouth parts also, uh, part of which uh, we find that issue where we, we look at those plants and they may not have a healthy appearance. They may have a, a stippled look to them. They may be a little yellow or, or chlorotic. Uh, these are the things that we find with these piercing sucking mouth parts. They also will have two pairs of wings. Uh, some of them might not have wings in the case of aphids. Uh, we may find them in a life a cycle where they do not have wings. But if they do, both of them will be membranous. We have Thysinopterus, which are our thrips. Thrips are a little bit interesting uh, in that they have a rasping and sucking mouth parts. Think of their mouth as sort of like a small saw blade. And as they run it across either the leaf or the stem, they then uh, damage the outside, which gives it the opportunity to lap up or to suck up the uh, plant juices, the extracts from the damage that they cause. Thrips do have two pairs of wings. Most of the time when we look at them under a microscope, they're going to be fringed or feathery in appearance. Normally, thrips are, are an issue early in the spring. After we get through the growing season or get it established um, during early summer to midsummer, thrips are normally not as much of an issue. Then we have insects such as the, the uh, Dermaptera, which are our earwigs. They also have chewing mouth parts. They can have two pairs of wings. The first wing set will be short uh, and, and uh, don't cover the wings completely. If we look at complete metamorphosis, this is the one that we think of when we, we think of insects. Uh, it has an egg that is laid. It hatches into a worm-like larvae. Does not look like the adult in any shape, form, or fashion. Once it reaches a certain stage, it pupates or puts a cocoon around itself, and then it metamorphoses into the adult that we see. 
In most cases, the larvae and the adults may even eat different types of foods. They may live in different environments. And in most cases, the larval stage is what causes the most destruction for us. Again, this shows the life cycle of a complete metamorphosis insect where the eggs are laid, the larvae forms, it then pupates, and then emerges as the adult. So when we look at these complete metamorphosis orders of insects, we find the coleopteras, which are our beetles. Uh, these adults are the ones that can chew the larvae or the grubs or the chewing parts also. Diptera, which are our flies, the adults are sucking and sometimes sponging insects, but the larvae, or what we call the maggots, have chewing mouth parts. Lepidoptera, which are our butterflies and moths, the adult has a siphoning mouth. The larvae, again, has a chewing mouth. Neuroptera, which are lace wings and ant lines. Again, both the adult and the larvae have chewing mouth parts. And hymenoptera, which are our bees, our ants, and our wasp. The adults are chewing. The uh, larvae, or the grub, is also a chewing mouth part insect also. So when we look at identifying these, we, we can look at breaking them into the different orders. Again, the coleoptera are going to be our beetles, our weevils, the white grubs and borers that we fight, dermaptera or things such as earwigs, dipteras are flies, mosquitoes, gnats, and midges, uh, hemiptera are our true bugs, uh, the stink bugs, plant bugs, squash bugs, box elder bugs, things of those issues. Homoptera are our scale insects, such as mealybugs, white flies, aphids, adelgids, the cicadas, and leafhoppers. And then the hymenopteras are our bees, ants, wasps, sawflies, and horntails. Lepidoptera are our butterflies and moths, or the caterpillars and cutworms that we may find in the field. The neuroptera are our lace wings, ant lines, snake flies. Manispids, dobson flies, dusty wings and outer flies, orthopteras or things such as our, our grasshoppers, crickets, and our praying mantis, and thysanopteras are thrips. Now, as we go through those different things, we're going to see a combination of both beneficial insects and the destructive insects. So when we look at these insects, understand that a, a majority of them are not destructive in nature, but we do see the visible signs of those that are destructive. Our chewing insects, as we said, will chew off the external parts of plants. The piercing sucking insects are going to pierce through the, the epidermis of the plant and then suck the sap from those cells. The internal feeders are going to feed within the plant tissue. These are our borers. Subterranean insects, they're going to attack either at or below the soil surface. These are things such as our sap suckers, root borers, and gall type of insects. And then we may actually find animals, or, or insects rather, uh, that may cause issues or damage when they lay their eggs. Cicada is a good example of this. Their ovipositor is like a large saw blade. They split the bark. And then they lay their eggs in that split, which causes a physical damage to that plant tissue that we see after the emergence of those insects. We may actually find problems with nesting or food materials being used from those plants as they build their nest or as they use food uh, for their nest also. And then one of the major issues we have to be concerned about is that some of these insects, especially those with piercing, sucking mouth parts, can disseminate other plant diseases. Um, so these are the ones that we have to ex be extremely careful for. We need to watch for any signs of these um, insects and, and know that the potential of any disease increases when we find a high amount of of these insects with piercing, sucking mouth parts on our plants.
Now, we also find benefit uh, and value with certain insects. We know that there are pollinators that are, are just almost a necessity for vegetable production. Uh, we have insects now that are being bred for specific weed destruction. And uh, if we look at it, there is a, a thistle weevil that is out there. The, the uh, larval stage will eat the seed heads of the thistles, which prevents it from producing seeds and breaks that biennial cycle. The insects also can improve their soil physical conditions and properties by improving aeration, by helping to, to uh, colloid those soil parts together. Uh, and, and they also can work such as scavengers, predators, and what I love is the parasites. Uh, we have insects that will parasitize the bad insects for us where we do not have to try to use any type of control measure. So when we look at trying to reduce the amount of chemical that we use in uh, organic farming, one of the things that we have to do again is make sure that we have a proper soil, that that, that soil is prepared where that plant is going to be at its healthiest. One of the things that we have noted over the years is as plants are stressed, as they uh, may be damaged, they put off a signal which attracts other insects, almost like a pheromone. So when you get a weakened or a damaged plant, they can actually attract more insects, which then further exacerbates the damage that we find. So making sure we have a healthy soil where that plant is healthy and grows without as much stress as possible is imperative. Then we look at the plant selection. Are we uh, selecting plants that are, are well adapted to our area? Do they show disease resistance? Do they have some types of insect resistance? And are we planting the best possible transplants so that we're not starting off with stressed plants uh, and bringing insects into our, our crops earlier and further exacerbating those problems? We look at cultural practices to try to break the cycles of insects also. We can do rotations of the crops, and that means getting out of the family of that crop so that the insects don't continue to build year after year. We can look at providing interplantings, things that's going to improve our beneficial insects or break the cycle of certain insects crossing over into other fields or rows. We can look at thinning and watering those plants. That way we're providing good sturdy plants that are not stressed. We can also look at the time that we plant. We want to plant at a time where some of the destructive insects may not be as active. Uh, and, and we can really control what insect pressures we have by gauging when we plant. Also sanitation, if we find insects or disease-ridden plants, remove those from the field and destroy them. That way you're removing a source uh, from your, your crop. And the biggest uh, thing also is to avoid injury. If we go through cultivating, uh, any damage that we occur, again, will put stress on that plant. That plant will respond to that, and those insects can come straight to those injured plants. So what are some of the things that we can do to try to control uh, the insects if everything we have done culturally, culturally does not work? Well, we can look at mechanical controls. We can actually hand pick the insects off. And if we have a small field or if we have a small number of plants, hand picking may be acceptable, especially early in the season. Uh, one of the other things is traps. But I want to give you a word of caution on traps. Most traps have some type of attractant to them. If we put traps close to our crop and we do not have a high amount of insect pressure within that crop, we can actually attract the insects with the trap. And then once the trap gets full, they can infest the fields 
So we've actually caused ourselves an infestation by placing those traps potentially at the wrong time. We can look at baits, we can look at repellents, and then we can look at exclusions or barriers that may prohibit those insects from reaching the plants to begin with. Uh, a good example, early in the, the season, if we want to prevent flea beetles on eggplants, uh, potatoes, a lot of times we can use a light row cover that will cover those plants, will exclude those insects from being able to get to them. The next thing we will look at are biological controls. We want to look at predators for the bad insects, parasites, and potentially even pathogens that are going to impact. Uh, in the organic world, we know that there are certain pathogens, such as the Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis, that will attack soft-bodied insects. Uh, there's also products that contain spinosad, which is another uh, off offspring of a fungus, basically, that, that will cause uh, death to soft-bodied insects. Now, again, they work well in soft-bodied insects, those that are in their larval stages. Once they reach adulthood and have a hard shell on them, they will not be effective. So knowing the type of insect, the stage of growth that it is in, and the product and its effectiveness is important when we look at some of these pathogens. Once we've exhausted all of that, we're going to look for pesticides. And when we look at those pesticides, we can look at things that are non-synthetic. These are our botanicals. Uh, they have natural pesticidal properties. Um, pyrethrin is a good example. It is derived from chrysanthemum. But the one thing that we need to be extremely careful for when we look at organic farming is just because it is natural does not mean that it is not toxic to humans, fish, and other creatures. So even though we're using a quote-unquote organic pesticide, we still have to treat it as being toxic. Because remember, it kills something. The other thing we look at are some of the so soaps and the oils. And those soaps and oils we can apply. It is a contact, which means it has to come into contact with the insect. And it covers or coats the insect. And, and for a lack of better terms, it smothers the insect to death. Now, for those that may not be organic, uh, we can choose also synthetic pesticides. The difference between the non-synthetic and synthetic is we may have synthetic pesticides that are made by man in a laboratory that are the same products or very similar products as a non-synthetic pesticide. But because it is made in that laboratory, um, it cannot be sold as a non-synthetic or an organic uh, pesticide. Now, the one thing that you're going to notice is a lot of times I will not give recommendations uh, on what particular insecticides to use. Part of this reasoning is twofold. One of them is if you're not in the state of Virginia, uh, each state is going to have differences in its recommendations and its regulatory activities on those products. But the other thing is, as an organic producer, you're going to have a list of approved products that you can use. So work with your local extension agent, uh, your local universities, figure out exactly what insects you might have the most problem with, and then determine what organic pesticides are going to work best for you and get those labeled for your farm. Now, as we look at all of these things that we've spoken about, basically we can put all of these together into a management plan. And, and we call that management plan integrated pest management. The reason we call it integrated pest management is this. Most people, when they see an insect, their main thought is, kill it, it's a bug. But if we look at all of the insects as a whole, less than 1% of all insects are considered to actually be a pest, which means that 99% or more are actually beneficial or do not cause any type of harm for us.
So what exactly is IPM or Integrated Pest Management? This is a sustainable approach that we put together specifically for our farm and our management style to manage pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that it minimizes both economic, health, and environmental risks. And again, when we look at a lot of these insects, the, the question that I like to ask producers is this, what is a pest? And by definition, a, a pest is a plant or an animal that is out of place. This can include diseases, weeds, the insects, reptiles, mammals, anything that is outside of where its normal area is. If it is out of place, it can be a pest. So my question is, when we look at this wonderful little insect, is this lady beetle a pest? Most of us are going to say no. We know that lady beetle larvae uh, is going to be a beneficial insect to us. It is going to eat some of those soft-bodied insects and is going to control their population. Well, if you speak to a homeowner who may have an infestation of lady beetles, in their opinion, it's a pest. So again, regardless of whether it's a beneficial insect or not, if it is in the wrong place, it can be considered to be a pest. So how do we look at trying to reduce the damaging insects, increase our beneficials, and try to, to create a healthier system that we're farming organically? Well, we can look at habitat development for these beneficial insects. We can use intercropping or strip cropping where we're introducing uh, plants into that field that's either going to improve the amount of beneficial insects that are there, or it's going to uh, uh, at least give an opportunity to break up uh, where the destructive insects may be uh, and not allow them to cross over. So if we're looking at intercropping, if we're looking at strip cropping, we're, we're going to want to look for plants that are going to improve the ability to have beneficial insects. We know things such as daisies, dill, Queen Anne's lace, buckwheat, a lot of these other flowering um, uh, products are going to attract beneficial insects. Those are the things we're going to want to try to plant either around the field or in strips through the field to promote the amount of beneficial insects um, that are present. To minimize infiltration uh, into the field, we may plant a trap crop. It does increase plant diversity, but our goal with a trap crop is to, to grow this crop that attracts the insect pests in order that it protects the crop that we're growing. So we're providing a food source for the insects as a border around the crop we're trying to harvest. And in essence, what we're trying to do then is prevent these destructive insects from reaching the crop itself. The other thing that we can do is, is concentrate the pests in a certain part of the field, so then we may be able to more easily manage it. Is it an area when it becomes infested that we can, can cut and then remove that crop and in essence remove those destructive insects with them to cut down on their population? We can use this in conjunction with the plants that are going to attract the beneficials and it can allow some of those good insects to increase their populations and control those unwanted insect populations in the trap crop. As a rule of thumb, some of the research that we have looked at says that 20% uh, of your total field planted in a trap crop seems to be sufficient uh, in protecting the crop that we grow. The last thing that we want to look at is some type of pesticide. 
<clears throat> this is our, our sort of our last choice. We know that we have reached a threshold or we are seeing economic damage to the plants or the fruits or the vegetables. And, and we know that we're going to have to use some type of chemical control to be able to, to suppress that pest. When we do that, there's a couple of things that we want to make sure that we look at. One of them, again, is selectivity. We want to make sure that we're using the product that targets our pest as best as we can and will not do any adverse harm to beneficials or other insects. For some of these products, they may have a residual activity, which means they, they stay around on the plant for maybe a few hours, a few days, maybe a week or two at the most. That way, if another generation of insects come, there's going to be enough activity there that they are going to be destroyed by the product that is used. And then to protect our pollinators, we want to make sure that we look at the time that we make the application. We want to use the least rate that we can for adequate control. And then we want to make sure that we're placing that pesticide where the pest is. If we look at the best time for us to apply a pesticide, uh, usually that is after sunset or before sunrise, before our pollinators become active. Personally, I prefer after sunset because then it gives all night for that pesticide to be able to dry and then to be able to, to hopefully not be as destructive on the pollinators when they come out the next morning. That concludes the entomology section uh, for the RMA grant. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, at the Extension Office in Scott County, Virginia. My information should be on the first slide that we have given. Um, and if not, my email is sjerrell -E -E at vt, as in Virginia Tech, dot edu. And my office number is 276-452-2777.